We thank you, Lord. May we rightly divide it. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, this morning, before we partake in the foot washing and the communion, of course, <clears throat> and I give my sermonette, don't, don't say amen. People are like, oh, I'm so glad it's communion. Pastor, I have a shorter sermon. <laughs> How could Eve be so hooked into the forbidden tree and eat of its fruit. If you have your Bibles, go to Genesis chapter 3. How could Eve be so duped here to partake of this forbidden tree that God had told not to eat from? And when you get to Genesis chapter 3, you can say amen. Those online, please participate with us. It says here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, don't get ahead of me, but who's speaking here? When Eve approaches or gets close to this tree, who starts talking to her? Well, don't say Satan yet because he's using this animal, yes or no, or this serpent, okay? The serpent, this, this, this created should we, is a serpent an animal? I mean, do we call it that or what is it called? A reptile. Okay. Help me out, friends. Don't maybe, yep. <laughs> a serpent is a reptile. That's my wife there. And he begins talking to her. And then she begins talking back to it. Now, that's not normal. When we had meetings last year, some that came to the meetings at UWF, they said to me, well, maybe before sin, animals spoke. Right? Maybe before sin entered the world, they said, because I was trying to show, you know, reveal to them what's happening. She said, well, may maybe before uh, sin came to the world, because sin hasn't yet almost, it's almost there, maybe animals could talk. And therefore, it was normal for Eve that when she went to the tree and this serpent is talking to her, she's like, well, that's normal. Well, let me say something right now. It's not normal. Animals don't speak. Okay? Animals don't talk. They don't communicate with each other. They, they might communicate with each other, but you cannot hold a conversation with an animal. I've had dogs and cats and pets. I've never spoken to them like we're speaking. Anybody ever has done that? Have you ever spoken to an animal? Yes or no? I knew someone's going to say a parrot. Parrots just repeat what they learn. Now, they can talk, right? But they can't hold an intellectual conversation. She is holding an intellectual conversation with the serpent. Now, Adam spoke. Adam could talk. Eve could talk. And... Also, God could talk, and go to, just stay with me, go to Genesis chapter 1, and let me show you from the Bible that anim, God did not give animals the right, or whatever you want to call it, to speak and have intelligent conversations as Eve is having with this serpent. We're in Genesis chapter 1, look at verse 25, say amen if you're there. And God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, 
and everything that creeps on the earth, does that include snakes? Well, they would. They could fly too. It's, uh, but uh, according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. So all the animals were made according to their kind, right? We have the cattle made in their kind, and we had, uh, I'm sure, dogs made in their kind. Though there are different types of dogs, a dog is a dog. You with me? Okay, so the animals were made according to their, what does it say? Their kind. But now we come to the next verse, and it says, Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every cattle, over all that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. So if God could speak and God can have an intelligent conversation, since we're made in his image, Adam and Eve could do as well. Does that make sense? But what was not made in his image? Yes, the animals. Are you with me, right? So the animals, God did not create them to talk and conversate. Let me go to Genesis chapter 2. Let me show you that. No, before sin, animals could not talk. We are in chapter 2. Look at verse 18. Okay, let me show you from the Bible that this is an unusual thing happening here with Eve. She should have known that something weird is happening. Animals were not created to talk. Can you say amen? We're in chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to whom? To Adam, look at this, to see what he, Adam, would call them. And whatever Adam called the, the living creatures, there was its what? Its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. So don't tell me that Adam could hold conversations with animals. Adam did not say, well, what do you want to be called? Well, I want to be called a lion. No. He didn't ask the animals what they wanted to be called. He gave them names. He could not hold conversations with animals. That's why he felt lonelier than ever. Are you with me, friends? God never created animals to speak. And of course, as she always does, the spirit of prophecy confirms this. We're told here, in uh, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 35, Ellen White says, She, Eve, was startled to hear a serpent speak. Why? Because they don't talk. For she knew that the serpent, or the animals, God had not given the power of speech. So when she gets close to this tree and she's hearing this serpent speak to her intellectually, has God said and this and that, and she talks back to it here, she, she understands that there's something going on here. I mean, mercy, to have a serpent speak to you, she should have ran. Just like what I do when I see any form of snake. You just run. Okay. And people say, oh, pastor, pastor, not all snakes are poisonous. To me, they are all poisonous. Okay. And they're like, well, what you have to do is if you see a snake and it has like this type of tail and this stripe on its back or one eye color, this and that. I don't have time to look at eye, co eye colors or stripes or tails. I'm running. Right? I'm not like, what, what eye color does it have? Or what stripe? No, no, I'm just running away. It doesn't matter. Okay? So if animals don't talk, never have, never will, in regards to like we do and conversate and so forth. Obviously, there was an agent, there was a being using this serpent. Yes or no? 
to speak. And who was using this serpent now to speak? Satan was, yes. Revelation 12, 9, so that great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. The enemy used this serpent that could not talk to begin to talk. Now, I want you to think. I want you to do what? And listen to my words very carefully. Here is this talking serpent hanging out on the forbidden tree. Maybe this fruit can make me wiser and higher. Did you get what I said? She knew animals don't what? Talk. But as she approaches this forbidden tree, this animal is talking to her, and all of a sudden, Satan exactly knew what he was doing. He was trying to fool her to believe that maybe this tree could actually make her grow and become something higher than she, because if this animal is eating from this fruit and he's talking, woo! Are you understanding deception here? And he begins to play on this. You will not die. For God knows if you eat of it, you will be like whom? Like God, knowing good and evil. Well then, of course, if this serpent, if this animal is talking to me, and the animals don't talk, maybe he's onto something. He's reeling her in. Animals don't talk, friends. Funny enough, when you look at Hollywood movies, cartoons, and many other things, what do animals do? They talk. Satan is the master deceiver. He's reeling Eve in. So when we get to Genesis 3, so the Lord said to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. Though of course it says serpent here, who is he talking to? Who's using the serpent? We've, the devil, right? He, he comes and he says, let me tell you something. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise its heel. There, there's going to be a, a battle here, and uh, a seed will come, and he will come and do something about what you, what the way you thought you won, you're not going to win. A seed will come, and he'll take care of the problem. Now, listen carefully. Go to Numbers 21. And now the serpent, right, became sort of synonymous with the enemy, right? The enemy is like a serpent now. He, he has venom and he's coming to kill and destroy. And he's cold-blooded. That's what, you know, a, a snake is cold-blooded. The enemy is co and, and a serpent became known for the enemy. And we have now a story in Numbers chapter 21 that these venomous snakes began to attack and, and begin to kill some of God's people because their constant disobedience and rebellion towards God, God with, 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 withdrew his protection that he had on them, and these snakes began to bite them. And we come to Numbers chapter 21, and look at verse 7 and 8. Say amen when you get there. Numbers 21, verses 7 and 8, and the Bible says, Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Verse 8. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall what? Shall live. Now, there is so much here, but look at the angle I want to take here. 
what did it symbolize that the serpent would be on a pole and if they would then look, they would live? Now, what did shepherds, what did shepherds have when they were shepherding? They had a staff, yes or no? Okay. Now, they had a staff, and many who go out where there are snakes, many carry a snake stick, yes or no? Yes? Hopefully. And when you kill a snake, you don't just go and pick it up. This is wise counsel. Please listen. When you think you've killed a snake, you shouldn't just go pick it up. Why not? Yeah, because you might think it's dead, and when you go pick it up, it's going to bite you. Yes or no? Okay. So, you go and you pick it up with a with a stick or a pole and you pick it up because many, um, when you kill a snake, you pick it up with a stick or pole. Look at this. So a snake on a pole meant a defeated snake. A snake on a pole represented a defeated serpent. Here in this story, the one who was bringing or the author of the suffering was defeated. The snakes came, the snakes brought the venom, the snakes brought the hurting, the snakes brought the death, but then when the snake was put on a pole, it signified that it would be defeated. It was defeated. Therefore, the snake on the pole was a symbol of the promise back in the garden that the serpent, Satan, with his venom was to be defeated and God would supply the anti-venom. This was a symbol. That when you look at that serpent, it's been defeated. Look and live. That serpent who brought the pain and suffering and death has been defeated, and I will supply the anti-venom. And Jesus uses this story to tell us exactly that. Go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We're about done. And then I'll apply it to our communion. Are you in John chapter 3? Jesus takes this story and applies it. He says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be what? Lifted up. Go to John 12. Jesus says, as in the days of Moses, that this serpent was lifted up and put on a pole, so I will be lifted up. John 12, look at verse 32 and 33. John 12, 32, and it says, And I, if I am, what's the two words? Lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would what? Die. So Jesus was lifted up on a pole on a tree, signifying that that serpent of old, the devil and Satan, the author of suffering and sin, was to be defeated. When Christ hung between heaven and earth on that pole, not only was he taking the curse that belongs to us on his shoulders, he was now, look at this, providing the anti-venom to defeat that serpent of old. And that anti-venom would be his blood. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, in him we have redemption through his what? Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of whose grace? That's right. So guess what? Again, 
when Christ was lifted up on a pole on a tree, signifying that he, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, the author of suffering and sin, would be defeated, was defeated. Not only would he pay the curse and the price for sin for humanity, Christ would have supplied the anti-venom for this defeated serpent. He was defeated. Satan was defeated at the cross. Just like that Old Testament story that when they looked at that serpent on a pole, they would understand that that serpent was defeated. And when Christ hung on that tree, he defeated the serpent and then put the curse of mankind on himself and paid the price for their sins. Satan is a defeated foe. So when we have communion, I want you to think of this, that when we partake in communion and the symbol of his blood, we are saying, I know that the enemy is defeated through the blood of Christ. And that blood is the anti-venom. The enemy is defeated. Why glorify a loser? Even he knows he's done. Revelation 12, uh, 12, it says in verse 12, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell on them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and, and, and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that his time is short. He knows it. Christ has won. And when we partake in this communion today, again, I want us to understand and think the glory and beauty that the promise back in the garden, when he speaks to that serpent, he says, let me tell you something right now. You might think you've won. You might think that you've pulled in humanity to be on your side, but I, get, I got a story for you, uh, devil and Satan. You will be defeated. So I'm going to end with this quote here from Selected Messages, book 3, page 172, and it's wonderful. There is salvation for the sinner in the blood of Christ alone. Where is our only hope found? Where is the anti-venom? In the blood of Jesus. I'm going to read it again. There is salvation for the sinner in the blood of Jesus Christ. What's that A word? Alone. Which cle cleanses us from all sin. Where's the anti-venom? The blood of Jesus. That's the sacrifice he uses today as he intercedes for us, not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his precious blood. This anti-venom, quote-unquote, that can cleanse any sin if given to him. The enemy is defeated. Hallelujah. The man with a cultivated and intellect may have vast stores of knowledge. He may engage in theological speculations. He may be great and honored of men and be considered the repository of knowledge. Now look what she says. But unless he has a saving knowledge of Christ crucified for him and by faith lays hold of the righteousness of Christ, he is lost. I don't care if you're a scholar or how much you know. That's not going to do it. We have, by faith, lay hold of his righteousness and his blood. Saved by the blood of Christ. Look at this. Saved by the blood of Jesus Christ will be our only hope for the time and our song throughout eternity. Does that sound legalistic to you? Saved by the blood of Christ, that is the anti-venom, will be our only hope 
for time and our song throughout eternity. It will never get old. The love of God can never be exhausted. It's going to be our song for eternity that we are saved by grace through faith alone in Christ and his righteousness. And the enemy was defeated. He was on a pole. He was done. And Christ uses this story and says that I be lifted up. I will draw all men to myself. I will provide the anti-venom. And that serpent of old is done. I paid it. Why would we want to? Why, why? Why would we want to give the enemy any any thought? Why give him any percentage of our life? Why even give him anything at all? He's defeated. He's nothing. He is done. Wouldn't it be logical to say to give to surrender one hundred percent of your life to Christ? not to a defeated foe? For those here who, are, who have still not yet fully committed their lives to Jesus, I pray that today, right now, you're going to change your mind and say, nope, I want to today say, why give the enemy any part of my life? Christ deserves everything. He provided the anti-venom. He, he, Christ alone is my Savior. Before you leave today, commit yourself to Christ and Him 100%, please. And hallelujah that today we have communion. Today is the perfect day to say, Lord, as I, we partake in foot washing, you, we, we cleanse ourselves in a special way, and we come back to communion and say, Lord, today I want to acknowledge that this symbol of your blood in your body is the anti-venom. The enemy is defeated. I want to surrender all to my Savior. I want to be one of those that will sing the song of Christ for all eternity. So what are we going to think about again this communion? That the symbol of his blood is the anti-venom and represents that that serpent was on a pole. He was defeated. Who here this morning desires to give Jesus 100% of their lives? Mm. I'm not going to ask you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Mm. Just between you and the Lord. The enemy is defeated. The time is now for God's people to make their choice now. I'm going to give you just 10 seconds for you to pray to God in your heart. Then I'm going to pray and then I will give instructions for what we have to do. But I'm going to give you just 10 seconds if the Holy Spirit is convicting your heart to surrender everything to Him right now, the time for you is now. If you say, oh, I've already done that, well, recommit your life again to Jesus 100%. Amen? I'm going to give you 10 seconds. Pray to the Lord in your hearts. Here we go. Father God in heaven, I pray that in their hearts this morning your people, all of us, will decide to take a stand for God and